Good evening, everyone. Just want to ask, uh, we're just going to give one minute or so just so we could allow other people to join us this evening. Uh, welcome and just give us uh, one or two more minutes uh, while we get started. Just want to allow some people to have the opportunity to join in. Thank you. Opening up to the public, Lucia. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome everyone. We're gonna allow about a minute so we can allow other um, people to join uh, this uh, webinar tonight. Thank you and welcome. Just uh, one minute about, thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to get started now. So um, I just want to welcome everyone tonight uh, to Senator Brooks Senate District 8 uh, webinar. Um, in honor of Women's History Month, we welcome you to our last lecture. Our last lecture will be hosted by Professor Dr. Bernadine Waller. Um, she is from the Adelphi School of S uh, Social Work. She is a senior faculty adjunct um, professor there for 14 years. Uh, Dr. Waller will provide us with an interactive talk on the impact of domestic violence and review some of the domains that are impacted. Um, before we get started, I would like to go over some Zoom features. Um, we would like to go over um, different um, screens here. We have the, um, the chat button. In this, you could um, include any, we'll include any links or information that um, we'll be able to share with you tonight. And then we have the Q&A. Um, if you have any questions, please, uh, you could um, write them down at the Q&A section. And we also have the raise your hand. Um, so in this one, if you're having difficulty audio or video, please use the raise your hand buttons so we could uh, fix that issue. Um, at this moment, um, just want to welcome everyone again and um, thank Senator Brooks for um, giving us this opportunity to virtually come and share this wonderful series with you. Um, you will see our Senator Brooks contact information here. Um, if you like, um, you know, if you uh, would like further information or if you have any questions or concerns, you can always call the office at 516-882-0630. Uh, Senator Brooks also has a Facebook page. Uh, you can also view all the series we've been having since the uh, month of March. So you'll have the opportunity to view all of them that have been amazing. Just want to be, um, you know, so grateful to all our speakers that have joined us uh, during that time. But at this moment, I would like to highlight our guest speaker this evening. And I'm just gonna share a little bit about her background. Um, Dr. Bernadine Waller is the national recognized leader in intimate partner violence research. She is an award-winning National Institute of Mental Health, T32 research fellow in the Department of Psychiatrists, Division of Epidemiology at Columbia University, Arving Medical Center and New York State Psychiatric Institute. Her research examines the intersection of the in intimate partners violence, IPV, um, help seeking and mental health with a specific focus upon black women. Dr. Waller's groundbreaking research is nationally founded and transforming the landscape of domestic violence service provisions. Her latest NIMH founded study developed three emergent theories that um, explicate help seeking among African-American women. Her scholarship was used to help shape the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women's Act and is currently being used by the New York City Mayor's Office to combat domestic and gender-based violence. She has been a subject matter expert in the New York Times and the Atlanta Journal Constitution and has written OPD articles for Newsday and the Huff Huffington Post. Her TEDx talk, Hinders help illuminates the barriers that prevent Black women from securing immediate assistance and is part of the required curriculum at several universities across the country. 
Dr. Waller is also the founder and CEO of B Empower Her ED, LLC, a full service trauma informed consulting firm designed to empower and elevate women. She earned a doctor of, of, of philosophy degree in social work and well as a master of arts in mental health counseling at Adelphi University, where she is currently senior adjunct faculty and um, as well as a Bachelor of Arts in Journalism with a concentration of legal studies from Temple University. It is our privilege and honor to welcome Dr. Waller this evening to share um, her insights and to share this important uh, topic and uh, which she has actually, if I may, uh, entitled it, Hello Queen, Breaking Barriers and Defying the Odds. And with that, I leave you with Dr. Waller. Thank you, Dr. Waller, for being here with us tonight. Thank you so much, Lucia, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to Senator, Senator Brooks and his entire team for inviting me here today. It is truly an honor and a privilege um, to be able to share my work with you. And so let us jump into my small little agenda for today. Um, this is what we're gonna be talking about today, but and we're gonna end up with Hello Queen. And so in preparing for this work, um, I just wanna foreground the fact that the topic that I am going to be talking about today can be emotionally challenging and triggering for you. And I also want you to know that self-care is extremely important. So that means that if you need to stop the recording, if you need to get up, walk away, pause, you are more than welcome and able, and I invite you to do that. If you need to mute at any time, I also want to invite you to do that as well. Because again, I care very much about your health and well-being as a clinician. So I wanna begin by sharing a small little snippet it's called, I Got Flowers Today. So I'm gonna stop sharing because it is a video. And if I don't stop sharing, um, you will not see the video. So hold on one second and we will begin to watch this video together. And again, if you need the time, um, I encourage you to do that. So I'm going to share now the, this video. And the one beautiful thing I love about um, Zoom is that we all have fun times with technology. Um, and so I wanna appreciate you for your patience, but here is the video. Hey guys, welcome back to my vlog. Uh, I got flowers today. No, it's not my birthday or anything special like that. Um, we had an argument last night and he said a lot of cruel things that really hurt my feelings but I guess he's sorry because he got me these flowers today. I got flowers today. No, it's not our anniversary or any other special day. Last night he threw me into a wall. And choked me. And then beat me till I passed out. I woke up bloody and bruised all over. It was actually a nightmare. I guess he is sorry though, because I got these flowers today. I, I got flowers today. No, it's, it's not Mother's Day or any other special day. Last night he beat me 
again and again and again. It was worse, much worse than any other day before. <laughs> he wanted to sleep with me and I'm on my period so I wasn't up for it. A couple of kicks, punches to the face and he had his way. <laughs> I got flowers today, and today is actually a very special day. It's the day of my funeral. Last night he beat me to death. If only I had the courage and the strength to leave him, maybe I wouldn't have gotten flowers today. So, I want to, I see that Senator Brooks has joined us and thank you so much, Senator Brooks. I know you're extremely busy. Um, if you'd like, I can stop the presentation for you to greet your constituents or I can keep going. You let me know which, which you prefer, sir. Senator, you're muted. Yeah, okay, I you. see. I, I want, I don't, I don't want to interrupt but I think the message you were just going through is important. I, I want you to continue. I'll, I'll wait. Okay. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you. And so I want to start off by asking everyone, what exactly is intimate partner violence? Oftentimes, when we hear about intimate partner violence, we oftentimes think domestic violence, and they're used oftentimes interchangeably. However, I want us to understand that intimate partner violence is slightly different from domestic violence. Intimate partner violence is between two intimate partners, whether current or former. So they can be married, they can be cohabitating, they can be boyfriend and girlfriend or just dating um, versus domestic violence also includes elder abuse and it also includes child abuse, right? And so I just want us to understand um, the difference oftentimes um, between domestic violence and intimate partner violence. Intimate partner violence, we often see it in, as, as being physical, but it is so much more than physical. It is psychological abuse. It is emotional abuse. It can be financial. In this digital age, it could also be your intimate partner looking at your social media and tracking your digital footprint, right? Um, the most dangerous of all the types of in intimate partner victimization is when a partner has what we call controlling behaviors. Um, and, and us researchers call it coercive control. And what we found is partners who are very controlling tend to be the most abusive and that's oftentimes um, leads to greater lethality. And so my research, intimate partner violence is horrific across the board, across all ethnicities. But however, my research focuses specifically upon African-American women. And I chose specifically upon, to focus specifically upon this population because African-American women do not experience the highest rates of intimate partner violence victimization. Worldwide, or actually nationally, 42 million women in the United States have experienced intimate partner violence somewhere in her lifetime. And it's very pronounced between for women between the ages of 25 and 44. Every single year, 1,300 women are murdered by their intimate partner or their injuries lead to their imminent death. It is the number one leading cause of premature death for women between the ages of 25 and 54. Now, what I also want us to keep in mind is October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, right? The interesting thing is, is that domestic violence or intimate partner violence in particular, more women are murdered by their intimate partners than are killed by, die by cancer, than are killed in car accidents, and or hurt by a non-intimate partner, and this is all of this combined, still more women are affected and murdered by intimate partner violence. 
The reason why I chose to focus specifically my research, my scholarship, and my clinical work upon African-American women is because although we do not have the highest prevalence rates, and I say we, myself as an African-American woman, we, however, experience the highest rates of murder. A Black woman in the country, according to our latest statistics by the Violence and Policy Center, Black women are 2.86 times more likely to be murdered than her white counterpart. Black women are murdered by the age of 35, which is six years younger than the national average. And so as you can see, intimate partner violence is devastating across the board, in particular, Black women. The CDC, just in 2017, Petrosky and her colleagues um, conducted an epidemiological report, which we you know, commonly call, layman terms, a trend report of intimate partner homicides from 20, 2003 to 2013. And the highest prevalence rates were among African-American women first, second Native American women, third white women, and then fourth Latina women. And so that's something for us to make sure that we are all as a community very much aware of and are concerned about. And so now that I've told you all about intimate partner violence and just how deadly and dangerous it is and how pervasive and prevalent it is in our culture, let's see if you are not or are not already in a relationship or know someone who's dating, let's see how to identify abusers. It is so important that when you are dating, when you're initially dating, that you find out your partner's history. Um, just a couple of days ago, I know, I don't know how many of you actually watched the Oscars, but the fallout from the Oscars continues even today with Will Smith having slapped um, Chris Rock um, after he cracked jokes on Jada Pinkett's hair saying she looked like G.I. Jane. The history behind that is that Will Smith, and most people don't necessarily realize this, is that his mother was abused and Will Smith as a child witnessed his mother's victimization. And so these are things you really want to know. Was a person's father or mother abusive? Was their parent murdered, incarcerated, or was there some sort of mental illness? And that is clinically what we call ACEs or adverse childhood experiences experiences. If there have been adverse childhood experiences, then there is a greater likelihood, two to three times more likelihood, that a child will replicate that. In fact, according to the scholarly literature, a young boy who's witnessed his parent being abused or being abusive are three times more likely to replicate that, and young girls are between two and a half to three times more likely to become and to pattern their lives after their parents as well. Also questions you might wanna ask is, are there unresolved issues with the parents, with the parent, with, her, with the person's father or their mother? Those are things that are very important for us to figure out. One of, of all the characterological disorders that a person with intimate part who is abusive typically has, it's what's called dependency personality disorder. And so you'll see that I framed this, I need thee, oh, I need thee. This is a person who really cannot live without you. They tend to be clingy, they may smother you. You may feel like they're controlling you, controlling parts of you, controlling your movements. They don't want you to go out with your girlfriends. They don't want you to really associate or connect with your friends. They may be also controlling the finances. Another personality type to be concerned about is what we call the narcissistic personality disorder. This is a person who's self-absorbed. Um, they may also have some sort of mental illness. The mental illness that is most consistent with a person who's abusive is if a person has what we call bipolar disorder. Um, and the characterological disorder, in addition to narcissism, is borderline disorder. So those are things you also want to make sure that you're very cognizant about. And then also, if the person has some sort of or struggling with some sort of substance abuse and or addiction. 
The last one that I want to bring shed light on is what we call Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? And so for those of us who are in the audience who remember that show, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you want to make sure that you're looking for this person's representative, right? You want to know whether or not they're controlling, whether or not if something happens, whether they're quick to blame you for something, whether they're looking to shame you or publicly embarrass you. And having worked with survivors, both as a clinician and as a researcher, I can tell you that public shaming and embarrassment tends to be some of the more common attributes that you'll see. Um, by the time it becomes physical in nature, that's when it becomes, it's way too late, right? Emotional abuse, and after a while, um, the abuse can, will continue to ramp it up, if you will. And so what I want to do is share with you one of the theories that I developed with the latest study that I um, worked on that was funded by the NIMH, and I part with the New York City Mayor's Office to combat domestic and gender-based violence. And so literally, when I look at the scholarly literature, um, some of the gaps that we see, studies actually show that racism and discrimination really do shape um, not just Black women, but women of color and marginalized groups. So I, I also want you to think of when I say African American women, I also want you to think about undocumented immigrant women. I also want you to think of transgender um, because this week was transgender awareness. I also want you to think of the LGBTQ community, right? And so the nature of the supports that people get strongly shapes how they look for help and when they look for help and to whom they think help actually is available to them. And so literally what we found is methodologically, um, there were no theories, right? We have all this literature out there in the scholarly literature, but no one had developed any theories as it relates to black women, specifically African-American women in their help seeking. And theoretically, um, Liang and her colleagues in 2005 developed the theory, one of the first theories of help seeking. However, there are gaps in that theory. So it's very cognitive in nature. It talked about um, how women think about help seeking. It did not really look at the society um, and, and how that shapes a woman's interaction with her society and how that shapes her help seeking. And that you will find is very important. And so the goal was really to develop a model that informs the psychosocial processes of help seeking among this population who really are seeking a solution to their abuse. The aims of this study were to explain or explicate their cognitive evaluations as well as their contextualized exercise of agency. So when I look at the methods, I looked, I used constructivist grounded theory methodology. Um, we had 30 respondents and I pilot tested the instrument with one provider and two survivors that really did mimic um, the population that I was going to have. The interview con contained or consisted of one brief demographic survey and one in-depth interview that lasted anywhere between 45 to 120 minutes. Um, audio recordings were transcribed verbatim. And what I did was use synthesized concepts from the trans theoretical model of change, intersectionality theory, and agency theory. And the reason why I wanted to use agency is for those of you who may already be somewhat aware of help seeking, you'll know that Walker back in 1986 developed what we call um, learned helplessness. And so what that does is position IPV survivors as being helpless and not having any strengths, not having any utility, not having any sense of agency. And having worked with this population for more than a decade, I can tell you there is nothing further from the truth. And so I'm not gonna go too much into that, but let's hop into the key findings, right? And so one of the key findings after experiencing barriers Several of these women said that their social context really does shape their help seeking. And so what you'll notice is that I have names here, but these are all pseudonyms, right? Just to protect the women. And so Sherry said, you know, we end up staying in the situation till probably we lose our lives because there is no help. Terry then also says, well, there, if there is help out there, I haven't found it as of yet. 
I feel like just when I reveal things, it falls on deaf ears. And I want you to understand that these were women who were already looking for help. Another of the key finding is that the beliefs about available resources really do shape people's help seeking. And so Jada said, I just feel like they really don't give a F. And Karen says, it's like you have to keep going over mad hurdles or lots of hurdles. And I feel like I have to fight to get out. And so these women felt like they had to be self-reliant and really fight through, not just fight through the perpetration, but they had to fight through the system in order to get the kind, the nature, and the level of help that they thought that they needed and deserved. And then the last key finding was that survivors since of individual agency really does shape their help seeking. And so Alicia to that note says, you know what, you just have to help yourself. And Tanisha said, you know, you're not going to just sit there and let them slay you. You're going to do what the F you got to do. And so as you can see in these women's quotes, these were women who were physically abused. They were financially abused. Some of them sexually abused. And they were experienced coercive control. Yet after years sometimes um, of, of experiencing intimate partner violence victimization, there was still a strength to them that was quite admirable. And so... What we do is what emerged from the data is what is called the theory of help seeking behavior. And just in time for today's talk, the theory of help seeking behavior just made it into the top journal for intimate interpersonal violence um, in the world. It just made, came out in the journal of interpersonal violence, um, which is the top IPV journal in the world. And so what this theory postulates is that survivors social context specifically their experiences with racism inform their perceptions about which supports are really available to them. And so the first construct I wanna to explain to you is women's social context. And this illuminates the ways that survivors positionality. And when I say positionality, I'm specifically talking about the ways that their race, their class and their gender, their gender um, influence how much of agency or in layman's terms influence that they have within their social context. And depending on how much strength in um, who they are in the community in which they're residing may depend on whether or not they're actually going to seek that help. The second construct is women's beliefs. And so women's beliefs about the different systems of support, the domestic violence service provision system that is available to them, um, whether or not it is really as helpful as they need it to be. For example, and this is not to pick on any healthcare providers who are out there in the audience today, um, but literally there is no uniform protocol to identify whether or not a person comes to the emergency department, whether their uh, injuries are a result of intimate partner violence victimization. All physicians will check your blood pressure, they will check your um, weight, they'll check your height, but they are necessarily, not necessarily, gonna check to see if your injuries were sustained as a result of intimate partner violence victimization. So that may be, uh, uh, you know, in that knowledge, women talk. We women, we girls, we talk. Um, and so we're gonna share that kind of information with one another. So that is very important. And last but definitely not least, is women's sense of strength, their self-efficacy, and their intentionality to act really do impact whether or not these women are going to get the help that they need, and in my opinion, that they deserve. So in conclusion, this theory of help-seeking behavior really did emerge um, from the data. It is the first theory that explicates African-American women IPV survivors help seeking um, and includes, again, three constructs. And this actually theory lays the pathway for intervention development, which is actually something that I'm working on now at Columbia. I want to end up with this. And oftentimes when we think about intimate partner violence victimization, we think about the physical aspects of IPV not necessarily understanding as a community the impact 
emotionally that this has on not just the woman, but her entire family. And so some of the things that I want us to be cognizant of is the first thing that is destroyed, and this is not just with IPD, with any trauma survivor, the first thing that is destroyed is their sense of trust and safety. So for all my clinician friends who are in the audience or burgeoning clinicians or people who are working with this population, what I want to encourage you to do is make sure you're always creating a place that is safe and secure. Um, and when I am working in therapy, I always tell my clients Vegas rules, right? What goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. So what you tell me is going to remain in confidence unless you say that you're going to imminently kill yourself or imminently kill someone else. When a woman has been abused, her sense of self oftentimes is ruptured and fractured, and she doesn't feel like she is a whole being. So one of the things that we want to always encourage women to do is find out who they are, who were they before the victimization, and who is it they want to be. Right. And so that negative self talk may be something that may be common among survivors. They may say things like, I'm ugly. No one's ever going to want me. I can't do this. Right. And so those I always believe are lies, but they are lies that women have told themselves as a result of the victimization because physical abuse and IPV doesn't just batter a woman's physical it batters their psyche and it batters their emotionality. I know we've had a lot of information this past year, the past two or three months with so many people committing suicide. I also want you to be aware of the fact that women who've experienced intimate partner violence, their thoughts of suicide are higher amongst this population than the regular population. And they're also more likely to attempt suicide. And so now that I've sh shared with you all of the emotional effects of abuse, I want to end up on a high. So hello, queen. And this is, I know I have some men in the audience, Senator Brooks, no offense, you're going to be a queen for this presentation, right? And so I want to start off by saying hello, queen. And why did I say hello, queen? Hello, queen, because a queen defined is a female ruler of an independent state. And why do I say that? It's oftentimes when women are victimized or abused, their sense of independence, their sense of agency may be fractured, right? These are female monarchs, they're royalty. And so I want you to know in this audience today, you who are listening to this video, that you are royalty. You are a female ruler of your own independent state, right? Also keep in mind that as a queen, for those of you who play chess, the queen is the most privileged piece when you're playing chess and they have the power to move in any direction they want to move. Also, a queen is attractive. So I want you to keep this in mind. And for those of you in the audience who may have experienced intimate partner violence victimization, if you don't remember anything else that I've said to you tonight, I want you to know that you are a queen. And I'm going to end with this last video. And just like, looks like I'm going to stop sharing, but I can't find my mouse. So I apologize, but I want to end up by stating that you are a queen and that you're valuable, you're strong, and you're able to do whatever it is you want to do in life. And so that is where I want us to end up on today. And so thank you very much. I'm gonna ask that um, my co-colleagues uh, assist me because it looks like my deck just froze and I am unable to unstop this, but maybe someone in the audience might need to understand and take the time. So I want to open up the floor now um, to see if we have any questions because I've talked and shared an awful lot and I want to get your take and get and be ready, ready to answer any questions you have on this evening. 
And if you have questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat. Actually, if you can put them in the Q&A, that would be better. And then if I could get some technical assistance, it seems as though my deck froze. Oh, here we go. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and so I wanted to, while you're thinking of questions, I actually have one more short little video that I want to share with you. And it really is um, celebrating the fact that we have a room full of queens tonight. And so again, I am going to share one more video and then... Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Harris, and I have an important question for anyone with arthritis. Which one of these foods contains a protein that can make... Hey. All right. And it looks like Professor Waller forgot to click on the share sound button. So we're going to try that one more time. Looks like technology just doesn't want to be my friend today. Let's try that again. I'm sorry about that. But as I'm queuing up the video, if you have questions, feel free um, to put them in the Q and A, and I would it would be my pleasure to answer them. And let's see, I think I have it queued up. Sister. <laughs> Girl, you've done it again. You are constantly raising the bar for all of us and doing so flawlessly. You do know that you're that girl, right? I hope that when you wake up in the morning and look in the mirror, you see how divine you are. Know that so many people want what you got. You have dreams to fulfill and promises to yourself that you must keep. I know at times you feel underappreciated and misvalued. Trust me, we've all been there. So it's necessary that you can count on yourself. Now, don't go seeking perfection. Extend yourself a little grace. Don't be afraid to celebrate the little wins as much as the big ones. You, Miss Thane, are courageous. You are dynamic. You are principled. So baby girl, just remember, respect is a minimum. There's a sweet justice in knowing that the path you are on was designed for you and you alone. Doing right by yourself never goes out of style. Everything about you is majestic and a force to be reckoned with. Trust me, people are paying attention. You're special and worthy of praise. Don't shy away from it. And you don't have to get your groove back because guess what, you never lost it. It's also important to rest. Make sure your hustle doesn't get in the way of your health, girl. Take care of yourself. And the next time you want to second guess yourself, don't do it. So pause for a second right now and relax, relate, release. You are needed, you are appreciated. Girl, you make me so proud and I love you. Remember, you are 100% that queen. Oh yes. <laughs> <sighs> And so what I want you to remember that you are that girl. You are who it is you were destined and designed to be. The path that is designed for you. I want you to have the boldness, the courage, and the, the drive to make it happen. You are brilliant, you are bold, and you are absolutely beautiful. And no one can outbeat you or outdo you being you. So hello, queen. And remember to walk through life being bold Hello, Discover and Card courageous. here to explain our I cash.
Thank you, Dr. Waller. I'm gonna turn it over to Lucia, but um, would you be able to put your contact information in the chat in case somebody wants to reach out to you um, after the webinar? That'd be great, thank you. Um, I will be turning this uh, to Senator Brooks, but before I do that, I just want to say what a powerful message. Dr. Waller, thank you so much for all the wonderful work you do, for the commitment that you have and the accomplishments that you have so far accomplished. I know there's so much more. The sky is the limit. Thank you so much for the incredible accomplishments and the contributions that you're making, the difference you're making in people's lives. Because you know what? We were created for a purpose. And our purpose is still to be fulfilled because it is true. You know, all of us here, queens, you are special. You are loved. You were created for beauty and you were created for a wonderful purpose. So, you know what? Dream and dream big because there's a big purpose for you. And thank you so much because, you know, having that mental positive attitude is so important, so key. And um, you know what? I congratulate you, Dr. Waller, and everyone who's watching this evening. I congratulate you for being a woman, for making a difference, for being powerful, because you are making a difference. The beauty relies not just on the outside, but the inner beauty. So remember, you are loved, always. So with that, I just want to pass it to Senator Brooks. Thank you, Senator Brooks, for really allowing this platform to really share this beautiful, wonderful topic. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Lucy. And first, uh, Doctor, I want to thank you. I didn't get to see all of the first vehicle, uh, the video, mm -hmm. but certainly what I saw was quite disturbing. Uh, I thought the information you presented was um, was was very important. Um, I, you know, right now up in Albany, we're in the process of trying to do the state budget, and one of the biggest discussion points right now is mental health. And uh, there really is a recognition that we have uh, almost a mental health crisis in this country right now. It obviously has been compounded by the uh, pandemic and all of the stress related to the pandemic and the medical challenges and everything else we have. But I think your message was so so critically important and uh, and I, I want to thank Melanie and Lucia and Rachel for the for the work they've done putting these programs together across the month. Uh, the we collectively have got to recognize that many of us, men and women, black, white, doesn't matter, face different challenges. Some some capable of handling, some not. Um, I think, uh, you know, with the information that you've provided, uh, some people can better assess the relationship they, they may be in that is troubled or challenged and, and seek assistance. Um, I think uh, one of the things we all have to realize is not to fear the idea of asking for help when you're not sure of what's happening. And, and I think uh, that's so critically important. You know, sometimes we think something's left of center. It's not, we're seeing some, something from the wrong vantage point, if you will. But more, more importantly is when something is wrong and we ignore it and it can go to, as your first ta tape concluded, that, that situation. So I think, um, you know, the last thing I was, was going to do is interrupt your presentation. Believe me, when I when I saw that, well, that's this isn't about me. It's about the information that's being provided in this program, and I just um, want to say that we uh, this this budget in particular, I've I've never re remembered uh, stressing mental health more than ever in in the budget. There's a lot of money there for programs. Uh, it's not going to be enough for everything, but it's a dramatic, dramatic recognition and a dramatic change in, in what we're trying to do. So I thank you for your presentation uh, and, and the information you provided. And those that are uncertain of situations that they might be in, they should, should definitely step forward and, and uh, see what you have. I see there's I'm, I'm not good at these computers. These guys run and said, I see there's a question in there. I think that somebody has that maybe you want to check and see. 
to everybody that's here, and I'm I'm not going to yeah you know go on and go on here. I I welcome you for for to uh, for joining us. I thank you for joining us, and um, I think there's value information that's going to be uh, provided tonight. So so I want to step away and let that be provided. I also have to do one thing. Most of my travel luggage and all is right now still out in the backyard because I came in and just hook the thing up as soon as I get home. And it looks like it might rain. So I'm gonna walk out and get that and then I'll come back on. But thank you all for being there, doctor. Thank you for a very important and wonderful presentation. And uh, ladies, uh, thank you for what you're doing and I'll let you take control of this. I'm gonna run and get some stuff in the house and then I'll be back on. All right, thank you. And again, doctor, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Senator. Um, and just to, to underscore what Senator Brooks said about us having a mental health crisis, I, I work in Columbia in the, in the psychiatry department, and that's something that's been the foreground for my colleagues and I. Um, the rates of depression have, 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 there's been a threefold increase in the rates of the depression, just one psychiatric illness alone during the pandemic. Um, and what we're finding is, is that in particular within communities of color, um, oftentimes what we're finding is there not a lot of, there's, there are huge disparities within healthcare delivery. And so that's something that my colleagues and I are working on now. Um, it is truly the foreground for what it is that we're doing and actually not to give too much away, but one of the projects that literally just got approved on Monday that I'll be working on is working to see with area churches to see what we can do to provide depression care to IPV survivors. Um, because depression has had a threefold increase and so has IPV victimization um, during um, this pandemic. And, and our children are completely devastated. Um, my colleagues who are in the school system, never before in my life have I heard the kind of devastating things that are happening in the classroom. Teachers are quitting at unprecedented rates. Um, and so you have security guards who are in the classroom these days because teachers have walked away from their jobs. Counselors have walked away from their jobs. And so there is not just a crisis in the healthcare sector, but a crisis in the mental health care sector. Um, there really are not enough people who are doing this work and the people who are doing this work, um, we need help, right? Because there are not enough of us. And after a while you become, there becomes a strain on the system. And so looking for ways for us to pivot and engage more tele mental health, um, ways for us to reach and connect with our clients. It was a huge shift. Uh, Columbia, one of my colleagues at Columbia actually just released a study two days ago. Um, and they did, th this was a global study on the mental health rates and how providers around the world, 90% of them have now shifted to using telehealth. So they're using Zoom, they're using Blue Jeans, they're using the telephone in order to deliver the services. Um, and I can tell you that the whole, the country is at a breaking point um, that is far beyond. And I would say that the breaking point was there prior to the pandemic. I think what the pandemic did was exacerbate some of the existing inequities um, and really did foreground some of the things that we may not have um, paid attention to because it wasn't so much, it wasn't so pervasive and so prevalent. So if you talk to, you know, my colleagues who do child and adolescent mental health, they'll, they'll tell you, you know what, you know, there's been a crisis among our children for the past 15 to 20 years, right? Parenting is different. Our parents are, especially those who are stay-at-home parents, right? During the pandemic, they were parenting, they were the school teacher. Um, and then heaven forbid, if we had a woman who was abused, right? Um, how is she now gonna get to her systems of support because she's right there with the abusive partner? Um, we also see nationally that there's been an increase of gun sales, right? Um, just in the past, you know, in the first three months of the pandemic, there's been a 700% increase in gun sales, right? And so, and one of the things, um, one of the area, one of the business sectors that stayed open, open during the pandemic, and this totally, you know, burned me as a clinician and um, mental health care practitioner 
is you you left liquor stores open. So here you have an increase in drug, drug um, gun sales, right? And you have liquor stores that are open. That was a very deadly, very deadly um, consequence. And in the first three months of the pandemic, so between March and June, some states and some cities reached the amount of deaths that they had for the entire year previously. So in three months, so for example, um, between March and June of 2020, let's just say New York had, I'm going to make a number up. Let's just say New York had 1,300 people who were murdered, intimate partner violence across the state, right? That was in all of 2019. In 2020, when we did our shutdown, um, we, when we shut everything down, between between March and June, we had already had 1,300 deaths in three months. And so what we're seeing trending, not just in New York State, but across the country, is that that was, um, those were some of the trends that we're starting to see. Um, and so, you know, Senator, I commend you um, for doing this work and your colleagues um, for foregrounding the importance. Um, myself as a clinician, as a researcher, I will share with you that, um, we are in crisis mode and who knows how long it's gonna take for us collectively as a society to improve our mental health and well-being. I also see, I wanna pivot. I see that uh, I believe it's, I'm not sure if it's Meta or Mita um, asked, how do we help women who are in the military, who are in this area dealing with domestic violence, specifically women of color? I actually have um, friends who, who work at, oh gosh, I forget the name of it, but he is a mental health provider. So what I'm gonna ask you do um, is if you could, and I'm going to, I and Lucia can see the chat, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. So Mita, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to provide you with my colleagues contact information personally. And what I'm going to ask that you do is send me an email to my Columbia email account. Um, because I, this is very important. This is very critical. There are agencies that help women, particularly women of color. There are agencies who have providers of color who can assist you. Um, one of my colleagues at Adelphi University School of Social Work is one of the, the agency managers of a domestic violence agency here in Suffolk County, um, who is absolutely wonderful, lovely, a huge advocate for survivors, and he would absolutely be helpful to you. Thank you so much for asking that question. Um, also, you know, keep in mind, okay, I probably should know this because one of um, my favorite uncle actually is retired general in the army. Um, and one of my classmates from my PhD cohort is a general, not a general, she's a major general in the army. Um, they do have resources in the army um, for that. Again, send me that email, whether you, um, and let me know whether or not it is active duty or whether or not you are in the reserves, because that may also make a difference um, as to the, the, the kind and the, the nature and level of help that can be provided and how I can further direct you. Um, I wish I had that information at the top of my tongue right now, particularly for the military. I do not, but I do have access to getting that information to you. So please, 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 military. Um, other things to keep in mind, and I'm glad uh, I had Mita ask me that question about the military. Um, and, and this is not, again, this is a broad generalization. I am not bow mouthing men who are in the military, but military, police officers, firefighters, um, those tend to be some of the nature of work um, that is more common among perpetrators than not. Um, people who are in those areas or those lines of work. Um, and so I want us to keep that in mind too. I see, Senator, you have your hand raised. Yeah, how about that? I just uh, I just wanted to add, I had to run down the stairs quick, but uh, I happen to chair the Veterans Committee in the State Senate. And one of the things we are actively working on is uh, assistance to all veterans and putting particular attention on females. 
And there are a number of programs, one of which known as the Dwyer program, which is a peer-to-peer -peer program uh, that, uh, you know, the ladies that might be having some issues in that area may want to contact in the local area. Um, the peer-to-peer uh, -peer program, you're, you're working with a fellow veteran and, and, and um, with the issues that you may be dealing with who's been down that road, if you will. Uh, there's particular interest in increasing the number of female veterans that want to share, serve as uh, peer monitors with the people. So I, I just thought it was interesting that that question had come up. I wanted to get the, the stuff in before it rains. But um, on, in the Veterans uh, Committee itself, we are very much looking at uh, issues associated with women, women in the service. Uh, the Unfortunately, the suicide rate uh, for women is up there as well. Uh, and this particular program uh, really is, is a wonderful uh, situation, getting great results. We've seen suicides come down. Uh, we're dealing with many of the aspects. Uh, initially, it, it dealt principally with uh, people that, that uh, associated with the Vietnam War. Uh, now it's expanded. Greatly so. While that was out, I just I just wanted to throw that out that uh, you can s contact some of the veteran programs in the area. Ear, ask if you have a Dwyer program, and then and then go forward with that. And hopefully, uh, you can deal with somebody that has dealt with the same issues. Uh, and and then with any good luck, you'll be able to get a female monitor to work with you. So a mentor, I should say, to work with you. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Thank you so much, Senator. And I also see two additional questions. Um, is there some place for an abused woman to go when she needs help? Yes. Um, so there is a domestic violence helpline. I normally share that. Um, so let me get that information for you. So there's a domestic violence net hotline that you can use. There's also, um, let me find that for you. Um, the domestic violence, and call. There are also agencies that are right here in Suffolk County. So the domestic violence 1-800-799-7233. And I'll put that phone number in the chat for you. And the domestic violence, the national domestic violence hotline has connections to agencies that are local for you. And so it Typically, when a woman is looking for help, it typically takes about seven attempts. Not all women women are looking to actually leave their 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 perpetrator. For some women, they're financially dependent upon their perpetrator. Um, in which case, that's a whole nother talk I can give you about about uh, equal pay day for women and how we need to make more women and how there needs to be pay equity. Um, but it really does have implications to a woman's ability to actually actually look for help and receive the the help that they need. Um, and so it may take a woman anywhere from a couple of days to a couple of months for her to situate herself. I've worked with women who have gotten identity and name changes, social security changes, and have completely ro relocated that we, they basically disappear into thin air, if you will. Um, one of my most, um, during data collection, one of my most salient experiences was talking with a woman who needed to leave um, her perpetrator because he was set to come out of prison in another couple of weeks. And she said, listen, Bernadine, you know, I need to get out. What could I do? Um, and so I talked with the providers and we were able to work together to make sure she was able to relocate safely. So her and her children were provided identity changes um, as well as a place to relocate to. They found jobs for them and she was able to land safely. Um, typically emergency housing, and again, I see it's 701, so I'm gonna stop, um, but emergency housing can be interesting um, depending on the shelter service. Sometimes emergency, emergency housing lasts anywhere between six to 12, sometimes 18, but that's maybe pushing it for 18 months. Um, it is generally very difficult um, for this population, they tend to be the most transient and IPV survivors are typically 
outside of veterans, the highest rates of homelessness and housing insecurity. Um, and so that's something else that we need to, as a community, make sure that we're aware of. Um, and so again, if you know someone, I wanna encourage you, um, vibes, yes. And that is where my, my friend works. Um, Anthony Zinkus works at Vibes. Um, it is a phenomenal um, nonprofit organization if you email me to one of my emails, I'll make that warm handoff and I'll connect you personally with Anthony. And now I'm done. I am going to now turn it over to Lucia. And thank you again so much for having me. And again, remember, if you remember nothing else, remember how beautiful you are, how gorgeous you are, how fearfully and wonderfully made you are. And there is nobody like you and nobody who can do you like you. Thank you. Amen. That's beautiful. That's so beautiful and very powerful. Thank you so much for your valuable information, really. Uh, we are blessed that you were able to be here and share this wealth of information. Senator, is there anything else you would like to mention uh, before we close off? Sorry, no, uh, no, I just uh, apologize for folks that uh, I, I didn't get online sooner, but uh, the ride down from Albany today was not a not a quick one, but um, I appreciate the work the, the ladies put into this program. I hope uh, some folks got out of that. Doctor, I appreciate uh, your words of wisdom. I think I might like to talk to you uh, at a later date to talk about maybe things we can do legislatively to help folks out. Uh, and um, Melanie and Lucia and Rachel and Joe, thank you very much for your efforts here. Um, uh, while, um, while this is a month that we, we, um, pay particular attention to, uh, the ladies of this world, um, I think, uh, realistically, we, most of us do that round the clock all year long, but, uh, we thank you for all your many contributions, uh, the many roles that you've taken on, and, um, you know, the blessings you bring to this nation as a whole. So thank you all very much this month, uh, in this uh, this month. And um, we look forward to uh, working with you and providing some additional programs for you in the, uh, in the days and months ahead. So thank you all very, very much. Thanks again. And thank you to our beautiful audience for joining us tonight as well. And all our the staff and Dr. Waller, we're really grateful again. And thank you. Have a great night. Please stay tuned. We're going to have other webinars coming on. And also, if you want to watch the other series, you can go on Senator Brooks' uh, Facebook page and you'll be able to view them as well. Well, thank you again. Have a blessed night. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.